Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Marjorie Lawrence. How Pan Came to Little Ingleton. Little Ingleton, drowsy in the summer sun, lay curled like a sleepy child in the hollowed arm curves of the mother and green hills that cradled it. Warm and white and frankly sleepy on a Sunday afternoon lay Little Ingleton, and the Reverend Thomas Minchin was cross. In the inexplicable absence of Potts the bell ringer, Mr. Minchin was tolling the schoolhouse bell for Sunday school. He tolled the bell industriously, but the wooden lich gate gave no click to announce an entering scholar. The waiting cypresses stood tall and grim behind the old green mossed headstones, jostling each other up and down the little hill perched graveyard, and the Reverend Thomas peered out now and again, and gave the bell an extra angry tug in his annoyance, but sleep and the idleness of midsummer day held his parishioners, and not even Mrs. Rosamond Perkins, the lady teacher in the Sunday school, seemed to mean to turn up. So at last, with a primmed up mouth, with a primmed up mouth and a scowl that rivaled those on the faces of the grimacing gargoyles that watched him go, the Reverend Thomas Minchin, newly installed incumbent of Little Ingleton, clapped on his black shovel hat, and stalked forth to find his strayed flock. The Reverend Thomas did not yet know his way around the village very well. He was aware, as he plodded up the twisting little main street, looking vaguely for the turning to Mrs. Perkins' lodgings, that he looked like an incongruous figure in his dusty black garb, against the prevailing glory of blue and gold and white, and the knowledge somehow gave an added edge to his already ruffled temper. He was a lean, stooping, ascetic of a man, with narrow lips and pale, intolerant eyes, and his primly buttoned black clerical coat over tight black trousers and clumping square-toed boots, his flat black felt hat jammed squarely down on his head, expressed his personality as surely as any Cartesian's painted smile and shadowed eyes express hers. Although, to be sure, he would have been mightily enraged by the comparison, for was he not a man of God, a celibate, a teetotaler, a non-smoker, and in a word, all the other things that a clergyman, be they the press, should be? This being so, surely he should have earned the respect and obedience of his people, so that they flocked to listen to the word. But the remembrance of the empty schoolhouse that afternoon brought a fresh scowl of sour anger to the face of Reverend Thomas, and as he turned into the winding lane that seemed to resemble Mrs. Perkins' description of her road, he muttered a word that in a layman's mouth might have resembled profanity. Had he not instituted fresh services, countless in number and strict in their ordinances, suppressed dancing on the village hall or on the green, closed down the Georgian crown except for the sale of ginger ale and such innocuous drinks, banished from the chemist's shop poudre riz, lip rouge, Sense and other snares of the devil. Who but he had worked unceasingly for the regeneration of little Ingleton, sunk as he had found it, in idle happiness, but with one or at most two services a Sunday, and used, low be it spoken, to the lack ways of his predecessor, old Father Fagin, frail, gentle, kindly, who, it was whispered, at times so far forgot his duties as a clergyman as to watch and even take part in dancings and singings and junketings on the village green. Even Miss Rosamond Perkins, who wore pretty summer dresses of pink or blue and yellow, patterned with gay little flowers, and had bright eyes and cherry lips, though to be sure, the Reverend Thomas had never noticed whether her lips were red or no, even Miss Perkins was reputed to have danced and laughed and played with these little unregenerates before the advent of sterner ways. Now he came to remember it, Miss Perkins had actually once or twice been guilty of murmuring on a fine Sunday in the hot classroom that it might be better to take the children out in the woods to play with God, to quote her own unusual phrase, to play with God in his lovely world, than drone sleepily over their Bibles. But this had greatly scandalized the new vicar, and he had spoken so severely to Miss Rosamond Perkins about it that she had wept and looking up at his austerity with eyes like bluebells drowned in tears, subsided into silence. Subsequently, he remembered with satisfaction, 
She had discarded her frivolous patterned cotton frocks, her hat with its wreath of floppy roses, and taken to brown holland and a severe straw hat with a band of ribbon only. This had pleased him, as showing a commendable wish to improve. But today he remembered the earlier rebellious murmur, and reviewing things grimly in his mind, decided that for some reason Miss Perkins had suddenly broken out and taken her little band of scholars to the woods or fields. He quickened his step, sending up a little cloud of light flowery dust, and his lips tightened as he peered through his short-sighted eyes at the names on the gates of the cottages. Rose Nook was the name of the cottage he knew, but it was strange. It seemed much farther down the lane than he had surmised from Miss Perkins' description. Just round the corner of Pan's Lane, you can't miss it. Now he came to think of it, he supposed this was Pan's Lane? Curious name, that. Might have some connection with the old Roman times and their crude gods. Curious how traces of that sort of thing linger. The squire had told him that King's Panton, the little town in the Valley Hollow, far below high-perched little Ingleton, was so called for its old name, King Apan's High Town. Strange old heathen days. How thankful one should be for modern education and enlightenment. Now where was Rose Nook? It was tiring, plodding along in this heat, and the mental picture of Miss Rosamond Perkins, cool and happy in some sylvan dell, with the adoring children around her listening to some absurd fairy story, the sort of imaginative rubbish she was far too fond of telling, made his ill temper, already sour, more acid still. He would find out from old Mrs. Calder where Miss Perkins lodged, where they had gone, and follow after them. He would come upon them suddenly in their idleness, and see them cringe in shame and confusion before his righteous wrath, hurry tearfully back to the schoolhouse and their books and catechism. And as for Miss Perkins, she must be spoken to severely, more than severely. He was walking so fast in his wrathful energy that in the cloud of dust he was raising he could not see anything distinctly, and stumbling over an obstacle in his path, came down full length on his respectable nose, knocking himself completely breathless. When, winded, angry and thoroughly undignified, he sat up at last, he found the obstacle over which he had stumbled was not one, but two, the long legs of a shabby young man in travel-stained gray flannel trousers, no shoes or socks, and a torn blue shirt, who sat surveying him gravely over a half-eaten hunk of bread. "'My goodness,' said the young man, "'you did come a cropper.' He laughed and took another bite. The Reverend Thomas was still too breathless to reply, but he blinked and stared, endeavoring to recover a touch of his lost dignity, but as he stared around him, interest in his dignity was lost in his growing astonishment. Little as he knew of little Ingleton, he was under the impression that he certainly knew by now all the lanes that ended in the field paths or cul-de-sacs but it appeared he did not, for this lane was certainly new. Somehow it seemed to have fizzled out into a mere field path, winding away over the sloping hillside. Glancing back, Mr. Minchin's puzzlement increased, and he concluded that, lost in his thoughts, he must have tramped farther and faster than he meant, and left the village itself far behind. A copse of trees, through which the tiny path wound, stood at his back, and all around, the stillness of a summer afternoon brooded over green hill and sleepy valley, sentinel woods, and white-flecked shining sky. Under the lee of a steep bank, the strange young man sat, nodding cheerfully at him, and continued to munch his bread, throwing the crumbs to an impertinent red squirrel that, to Mr. Minchin's great amazement, sat perched and chittering at his elbow. Transferring his attention to the young man himself, Mr. Minchin frowned. He wore no hat, and his face was brown as a pine cone, his hair bleached and wiry with the sun and wind. It stood up over each eye with a comic, alert whisk that gave him a curiously impertinent appearance. His face was long and thin, with a narrow chin that ran to meet a hooked nose that stood out like a wedge between the two light eyes, dancing irreverent eyes the color of a hawk's. The Reverend Thomas winced, and looked away from those eyes, 
and his resentment increased. What business had this ragged vagabond to survey him with such obvious amusement? He should have lowered his own eyes in shame at his garments. They were well cut enough, but disgracefully torn and travel-stained, and that shirt. Well, not only were the sleeves rolled up to the shoulder, but the unbuttoned front lay open almost to the waist, showing skin burnt brown as the merry face, or very nearly, thus proving indubitably that this graceless fellow was in the habit of doing without even a shirt very often. It's so much cooler in this hot weather, said the stranger. He took another bite, and Mr. Minchin jumped. So astonished was he that he remained sitting on the path, his hands spread to each side to support him, staring at the young man who had so curiously guessed his question and answered it. Coincidence, but odd, very. Decent clothing is hardly a question of convenience, he said stiffly. The hooked nose came down over the lean chin, and the young man grinned, surveying the dusty figure before him. Obviously, from your point of view, or you wouldn't wear those horrible black things. Why do you? Mr. Minchin gasped in amazement, not only at the revolutionary suggestion contained in the remark, but at the stranger's temerity in making it. He answered severely, rising and dusting the insulted clerical garments as best he could, though he was conscious, under the scrutiny of the merry-eyed stranger, that he was not cutting his usual dignified figure. You do not seem aware, sir, that I am a man of God. The stranger twinkled again, quite unimpressed. I can see that you are a clergyman, all right. Is that what you call a man of God? Mr. Minchin was outraged. Sir, are you not a Christian that you would ask me such a question? The stranger threw a handful of crumbs to the waiting squirrel and, clasping his hands around his dusty knees, surveyed Mr. Minchin again, then laughed softly, oddly. A Christian? I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Then it's quite time you were, said Mr. Minchin virtuously. Time? Ah, there's so much time, isn't there? said the stranger, rather irrelevantly. But to continue, O man of God, what brings you wandering out here on this Sunday afternoon, when presumably all men of God should be herding their flocks willy-nilly into the church? The faint flavor of insolence in the stranger's tone, strangely matching his impertinent upflaming hair, stung Mr. Minchin, and his response was severe. I agree with you, but unfortunately my Sunday school class did not appear, and I came out to find them. The young man, hunching his shoulders back against the warm red earth of the bank, laughed suddenly, amusedly, a gleeful spurt of laughter, like the uprush of a spring to the sunlight. So for once Pan won, eh? The old gods against the new. The lure of the sun and the hills and the blue, blue sky. Ha ha! Well, my worthy son of the Christian church, go on. So you came a-wandering to find your straying flock, eh? Er... Yes. For the life of him, the Reverend Thomas could not quite help an odd little feeling of trepidation under the fire of the yellow hawk's eyes that watched him, and he finished lamely, and I, er, wandered considerably further than I meant. You did indeed, said the young man grimly. There was a moment's silence while he eyed the clergyman up and down. Then down came the hooked nose again in a grin, and rolling over, he stretched for a shabby knapsack, reposing against a giant root. Down Pan's Lane, into Panton Wood, over against Pan his town. And all on a midsummer day. Oh, wonderful, amazing, my poor dear earnest-minded friend. He extracted a fat round bottle and tin mug from the bag as he talked. Sheer nonsense to the puzzled clergyman, and uncorking the bottle with a pop that certainly sounded more than luscious and tempting to the thirsty ears of the vicar of Ingleton, poured out a foaming crimson draught and held it out invitingly. Have a drink, old boy, but I'm thirsty too, so drink fair. Despite his iron prohibition principles, it was with quite a considerable effort that Mr. Minchin waved the mug away. Thank you, no. I realize you mean it kindly, but my cloth forbids. Your cloth? Good Lord! The stranger's laugh was faintly scornful. 
I've had many a cheery drink with other fellows of your cloth, as you call it. Come, drink up. I am, fortunately, not concerned with the irregularities unfortunately committed by others of my calling, said Mr. Minchin stiffly. Unmoved, the stranger quaffed the rejected wine. Over the top of his mug, his piercingly bright eyes stared at the clergyman. Mistakes. Are you then so much better than your fellows? He set down the mug with a flourish. I seem to remember somewhere something about a Pharisee who thanked God he was not as other men. The Reverend Thomas flushed angrily, confounded and momentarily speechless. Before he could think out a sufficiently crushing answer, the young man was off again. So you're the new vicar of Little Ingleton. I've heard of you. Round about King's Panton. We've been talking quite a lot about you lately. This was a sop, and though Mr. Minchin was feeling a little distrustful of this remarkable young man, he smiled. Cautiously, warily, but he smiled. The allusion to King's Panton relieved his mind. This was probably, now he came to think of it, one of Mr. Imray's fellows from the King's Panton Manor House down in the valley. The verger had told him he always had five or six studying for exams, reading for the bar, being coached. Doubtless, this was one of his pupils. Eccentric, of course, but obviously a gentleman. And to a gentleman even going barefoot and wearing an open-necked shirt might be excused, though Mr. Minchin secretly hoped most devoutly that the stranger would not walk down the main street a little Ingleton thus arrayed. King's Panton, that was fifteen miles away as the crow flies, it was certainly gratifying to hear that fifteen miles away they were talking of him and of his work in cleansing in regenerating little Ingleton. "'I don't know that I should quite call it that,' said the stranger coolly. The Reverend Thomas jumped again, and the young man laughed. "'Oh, I'm a thought-reader. What of my hobbies?' His eyes danced as he watched the other's chapfallen expression. "'Great fun it is. I often guess what our fellows are thinking about, and it makes them no end annoyed. But what makes you think you have done so much for little Ingleton?' Mr. Minchin stiffened. I think, if you have heard as much about me as you say, that I need hardly answer that question. The young man looked at him reflectively. That, of course, is a matter of opinion, he commented lazily. You may think that driving your school children into a stuffy room on a gorgeous day like this is doing good. Mr. Minchin exploded. Doing good? Doesn't the prayer book say? I know all the prayer book says. Read it all before you were born said the stranger brusquely. In his annoyance, Mr. Minchin failed to note this remarkable assertion from a young man at most twenty-four. I know God demands a certain amount of attention. His curious, half-wistful, half-insolent gaze strayed over the brooding hills, and he paused, then went on briskly. But I fancy, you know, that God is a fair-minded deity, and if folk come to worship him on a Sunday morning, what harm is there if for the rest of the day they give worship to other gods, and maybe other gods than he. Mr. Minchin gasped in horror and amazement. The poor young man was mad, surely. Mr. Imray should not have let him go out without a hat in the sun. As the alarming thought that he might be consorting with a raving lunatic crossed his mind, the young man jumped up, and bursting into a frank laugh, stood arms akimbo in the sun watching him. Through all the bewildered fright and anger that confused him, Mr. Minchin was aware of a quick stab of sheer masculine jealousy of the slim, wiry frame that confronted him, muscular and lithe and brown. Why, he was only just thirty-four himself, and he should be like this long-limbed, sun-tanned vagabond, not a lean, shriveled bone of a man buttoned into a black coat and deliberately turning away his eyes when a pretty girl glanced at him. Through the heat and confusion of his thoughts, the stranger's mocking voice came to him, taunting, accusing. Done for them. That's what you're trying to do. Do for them. Kill joy and youth and laughter in them to implement your wise and mean little creed instead. Because of your own dour, miserable narrowness, you're trying to bully them into living life your way, you, with your bigotry and prudishness that sees sin and temptation in a flower and a hat the gay color of a pretty gown. Black is the Lord's color, 
croaked the Reverend Thomas, though he was growing more and more dreadfully frightened, confused, puzzled. Why, oh why, had nice quiet Mr. Imray imported this crazy young man? His inquisitor's laugh was contemptuous. Are you sure you know him? He never said anything like that to me. And as far as that goes, isn't it in your dour creed that he created all things? So what of the scarlet poppy flower, the blue and purple of the hills yonder, the gold of Rosamond Perkins' hair? I have never noticed the color of Miss Perkins' hair, said Mr. Minchin stiffly. The laugh that answered him stung him with the flick of a whip. Poor fool! You kept your nose so long between the leaves of your dusty book of duty that you almost forgot you are a man at all. Almost. Almost you have remade yourself into a hard religious machine, grinding out texts and platitudes and conventions. And yet still because I love my people, and perhaps a little because under these black absurdities of yours I discern a real gem of a real man still, one worth saving, a crazy revivalist must be muttered Mr. Minchin to himself, catching at the explanatory straw. Above his shrinking head the voice went on, light, laughing, yet faintly menacing in its very laughter. Didn't you stop Molly Isset from wearing a pink sash? Tell the squire that to start a cinema in the village meant encouraging immorality, since it would be held in the dark. Get Miss Banks made Ellen sack because you caught her kissing a gypsy in the lane. Abolish the kindly old custom of giving bread to beggars each Friday, because it encouraged pauperism. Abolish beer drinking and the use of perfumes. Forbid dancing and singing, and refuse permission for the yearly pageant to be held in the vicarage grounds. All vanity, and turning their thoughts away from the Lord, snuffled the Reverend Thomas feebly, for he was very frightened. Above him, the voice seemed to be shaking itself into a song of triumph and scorn together, and he was shaking, cold, despite the glowing heat. From the Lord, O Allah, O Sete and Horus and Osiris, O Kali, Shiva, and all forgotten gods, O the ringing scorn of that laughter, shriveled tiny, the wretched listener felt as the voice boomed on. O Zeus, Apollo and goat-footed Pan, in the great world is there not room? Is there not room for more than one god? It was evening when Mr. Minchin awoke, and the slanting rays of the sun were touching his bare head over the bank. Staggering to his feet, stiffly enough, for it seemed he had slept a long time, he dusted and shook himself and turned to the copse behind him. The path opened out into the end of Pan's lane, up which he had trudged so wearily in the afternoon, and as the clang for the bell for evensong rang out, he hastened his steps. He had slept too long indeed. It was still a little way to the church, and he always liked to be there a good while before the service, fussing about the choir boys, heckling the patient little humpbacked organist, arranging and rearranging his books and papers. As he came down the darkening graveyard, he could see the people already filing into the evening service, the single bell swinging in the square tower, and he frowned. He would have to hurry to get into a surplus and head the procession. He almost ran down the incline to the crooked little vestry door that hid slyly behind a buttress, and rushing to the cupboard, reached for his surplus and gasped. It was no longer there. Neither his own, nor the clean white surpluses of the choir boys, ironed and carefully hung up every Sunday by Miss Kitson. As he stared, unable to believe his eyes, the organ burst forth into full volume, and he realized the dreadful truth. The service had begun without him. Staring vaguely around the vestry, Mr. Minchin pinched himself, at first doubtfully, then viciously. The shock of the pain made him realize quite definitely that he was not dreaming, and a wave of anger took possession of him. How dare they, meek little Mr. Lysett, his curate, Kitson the verger, club the organist, all the rest. How dared they venture to open the service without him? Was it possible that he had invited a brother priest to conduct evensong for him, and forgotten? No, it was impossible. Fraser of King's Panton wasn't free, and he knew no other. The organ boomed and surged around him. 
the choir boy sang lustily, and the crowding people sang too. Though the church was full, it seemed that a long line of dark figures, black silhouettes against the violet evening sky, still streamed towards the door, and as they came, they sang. Staggering to the little window, Mr. Minchin watched them come, never in all his life, certainly never since his ministry in Little Ingleton, had so great and eager a congregation besieged his church, and beneath all his bewildered anger, he felt a sharp pang of compunction, of shame. Surely, surely, had he known his work as he should have known it, this throng should have trooped before to listen to his teaching. Suddenly his anger left him, gave place to bewilderment and a nameless deep-seated fear, and slipping noiselessly into the dim-lit church, he crouched down in a distant pew, his heart for the first time in his narrow life humbled, abashed before a thing he could not understand. The tall windows were slips of gleaming purple, where the night sky showed through, and the one rose window in the nave, of gorgeous old painted glass, shone like a glorious jeweled buckler. The high-hung gas lamps down the center aisle shone out, round globes of yellow, like pale marsh flares in the velvet gloom, but it seemed either a few of these had failed, or else this summer dusk was heavier than usual, for the church was dimly lit on the hall. From his far corner Mr. Minchin could see the old pulpit with its supporting stone angels shrouded in their drooping wings. A corner of the lighted choir stalls, the carved oak lectern that bore the great leather-bound Bible with its gold-tasseled marker. As he looked at this, his eyes bulged and he drew an astonished breath. It passed in a flash. But for a moment, Mr. Minchin had imagined he saw an audacious red squirrel, own twin to the furry creature that had eaten crumbs so tamely from the brown hand of the strange young man, dash down the stem of the lectern and vanish beside the pulpit. It was a mere impression, of course, must be, but Mr. Minchin was not quite so sure of himself as he had been a few hours ago, and the supreme assurance with which he would have said imagination had its tail between its legs and was already sneaking ignominiously away. A little way beyond him stood a slim girlish figure, a child clinging to either hand, Rosamond Perkins, adorable in her pink-flowered gown, crowned with the rose-wreathed hat, her pretty mouth open as she sang, heartily, happily, her eyes fixed on the stall where sat the strange priest, grave and sedate, in the place usually sacred to the vicar of Little Ingleton. From his position, Mr. Minchin could not see anything but a white sleeve laid along the carved chair arm, the back of a head, yet he had the impression that the head was young, and suddenly, completely, a miserable jealousy seized him, and he knew he would have given anything in his lonely world to have had Rosalind Perkins look up at him like that. Fool that he had been, oh, fool and blind! The choir sang on, the people sang, and strange voices from every side took up the chant. Voices strange and, to Mr. Minchin's dazed ears, barely human at times, gruff and squeaky, shrill, bat-like, or deep and ringing as one in an insane dream one might think a goat's or a ram's might be. Old Miss Banks stood hand in hand with pretty Ellen, her dismissed maid-servant, dressed gaily as for a wedding in white muslin and ribbons, and beside Ellen stood her gypsy swain, and grim old Miss Banks' face was gay with smiles, and she wore a flower spray pinned to her cloak. Molly Izzet's pink sash gleamed beside a pillar, and a pink frilly hat accompanied it. All the village was there, and beside them in the shadows there seemed to be a thousand creatures more, strange and elusive, indistinct to see, yet present, a great concourse of tossing heads and rustling hairy bodies, bringing with them the scent of leaves and trampled grasses and flowers and behind these, more elusive still, others that Mr. Minchin did not dare to look at, slim, elf-like shadows, bright-eyed and wild, yet singing shrilly, lustily, with all their hearts. The singing stopped, and shivering, not daring to glance up, Mr. Minchin knew that the strange preacher was in the pulpit. 
Yet without glancing up, he knew who stood there well enough. It was the young man of the road, the mad student. In the lightning brilliance of those hawk's eyes that played upon him now, Mr. Minchin knew the truth, and shivering, cowered in sheer terror in his shadowy corner. Above him, his twin peaks of bleached shining hair like two flames under the flaring gaslight, the preacher gave out his text. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. With all his theology-trained heart, the Reverend Thomas longed to shriek, Blasphemy! Blasphemy! For was it not blasphemy to have to listen in God's own house to this that preached? Why did not the outraged heavens open, the earth split and swallow up church and congregation, the very stones consecrated by austere bishop and celibate priest crumble upon them for this impiety? But in the hush that settled over the dusk-veiled church, there seemed no note but attention, no hint of action from an outraged God. At last, raising his head from his hands where he had thrust his fingers into his ears, fascinated, Mr. Minchin listened, too, as the preacher spoke on. He spoke of the grave eternal hills and of their story, of the hills in whose cradling generous arms nestle grim druid grove and pagan altar, fairy ring and Christian church alike, of the rains and dews that settle in their folds and run together into streams and pools, deep lakes and mighty rivers, of the little bright unconsidered flowers that grow on the hills, and the myriad unknown creatures that live out their colored lives but of a day, the gossamer moths and lazy painted butterflies, the gray velvet ground spider and his black neighbor the busy ant, of the forgotten forts that, built by a long dead people, still face the sea, the green turf weaving a winding sheet over the sturdy bones of the old builders, of the cromlechs and dolmens, the strange stone rings, so old that even their purpose is forgotten now, of the battered altars to ancient creeds, so old that their very names are dead, the green groves in hidden woodland places, groves planted in honor of goddesses that rule no longer. He told of trees, of the bent and crooked pine trees that face the sea gales, the sturdy sentinels that stand guard over England and of her shores, of the green willow that trails her long hair in the brooks, the sad yew with its clustering red berries, the brittle lanky elm and its twin sister the larch, slim and elegant in delicate fluttering green, like a Watu lady, all powdered and panniered, ever whispering to her other still lovelier sister, the silver birch, superior as any Bond Street miss, and twice as fair, of the grave oak, whose roots are planted in Britain older even than we dream, of secret ash and subtle thorn, that trinity of pagan music, of the little furry creatures that scamper and fight and hide beneath the great tree boles, the quiet-eyed deer peering wary from the thickets, all the thousand and one shy people of the woods that live in love, happy in their untaught way. And when he spoke of man and his wonder and his strength, and woman in her beauty, and how man and woman were made for love and joy, and for the dear companioning of each other through laughing youth to hail old age. He spoke of the loveliness of love, of frank kisses betwixt honest man and maid, of the close pressure of hand in hand and heart to heart, the murmured holiness of loving speech, of marriage, and mating, and the proud bearing of sturdy children. And as he listened, the Reverend Thomas thought of the red lips and uplifted eyes of Rosamond Perkins, and smiled and trembled, and did not turn away. And above him, under the flaring gaslight, his twisting spirals of hair like pale horns, his yellow hawk's eyes roving the crowded audience, the preacher preached on, and now he spoke of others, of careless and happy things that roam the green woods in vivid lovely life, if not life as mere humans know it, of those that knew and loved their mother earth ere ever man ever set foot upon it, those older things that, retreating before man in his noisy dusty cities, yet laugh and, shaking their wind-blown hair, would draw deeper and deeper into their old fastnesses in mountain and cave and forest, unbaptized perchance, knowing no creed nor caste, 
marry pagan things that own no church, yet should there not be room for all beneath the mantle of him whose name is love, room for even these, for elf and satyr and white-browed nymph, merry brown gnome and wandering fairy, fawns with their goat feet, and green-eyed nixie with her dripping hair, all the old ancient things that man denies, since dust of city blinds his once keen sight. Yet, strangely, amazingly, the listener understood, and nodded happily, though his face was wet with tears, as the great voice boomed on, that voice that held in it the pattering of rain on summer leaves, the sweep and majesty of thunder on the cowering hills, the shrilling clearness of the stars that sing eternally in the outer spaces. And as he listened, it seemed to the Reverend Mr. Minchin that his soul shrank within him in shame of his past littleness, shrank to the smallness of a shriveled pea, and yet swelled to a greatness and happiness utterly beyond his knowledge, a happiness too immense to even grasp as yet. Yet remembering his past harshness, his bigotry, the narrow foolish laws with which he had sought to bind and straighten the great and laughing world, his mean, harsh judgment and lack of charity, in the shelter of the kindly pew, he wept and trembled, afraid, as the voice boomed and shouted above him, and he knew who, for the saving of his little soul, had supplanted him to teach the people truth. Lift up your eyes to the hills, whence cometh your help indeed. The hills whence came your fathers, the woods, the seas wherein dwell strange and lovely things undreamt of in your little lives, the aged, the eternal Mother Earth, Mother Earth from whose heart we come, and to whose arms we return at the last, man and beast and stranger folk alike, sing praises, my people, to the dear and goodly Earth and all those that dwell within, each in their kind and every kind and to all gods new and old that love the world. For beneath the mantle of the great God is there not room to shelter smaller gods. Abruptly the wonderful voice ceased. Confusedly, dazed by the tumult of emotions that possessed him, yet dimly afterwards, the Reverend Thomas seemed to remember a great and wonderful acclamation in which he joined, calling feebly, his face wet with joyful tears, the singing of a great magnificate, in which he vaguely remembered such happy lines as he had never dreamt the dourly thunderous psalms possessed. God has gone up with a merry sound, with the sound of the trumpet. He remembered stumbling out into the churchyard, ghostly, beautiful with its black tall cypresses in the moonlight, its crowded gravestones leaning against each other in the shadows, as if to listen to the happy chanting, the chorus of praise that followed him out into the open. As if in a dream from his place on the sloping bank above the path, he watched the congregation file out, two and two, like the figures in a Noah's Ark, a strung out line of black shadows against the gorgeous sunset, rose, green, and gold, singing jubilantly as they went, and smiled, without surprise, but with happy knowledge, as he saw, mingling with the village folk, those of a different world, beast and satyr and elvish unnamed creature, all come to shout their gladness in one great festival of praise. He saw old Kitson, arm in arm with his wife, and a fawn, goat-footed, leaf-crowned, pranced beside them and tweaked old Kitson's hair, and the old man laughed and hugged his old wife the closer. He saw soured Gertrude Pring, who ran the post office, companioned by two merry small things, brown-eyed and saucy, and Miss Banks, unscandalized, walk beside a sly-eyed young bacchanite whose white breast gleams shamelessly beautiful in the dusk. We Molly Isset held a fawn in leash that trotted sedately at her side, and two slim green nixies bestrode Dame Calder's pig. Sweet-breathing cows came by beside the tossing antlered deer, the snarling village dogs, now harmless and friendly, playing between their pacing feet, singing and waving branches of trees and garlands in the air, they wound away over the ridge that hid the village from the little church, and the sound of their singing was an echo in the listening air, 
yet Mr. Minchin waited, afraid, for the preacher had not yet come forth. The last chanting figure vanished, silhouetted against the blazing golden sky, and from the dark church door two figures came, shadowy among the shadows of the darkened churchyard, moving each by each, and as they went they gazed into each other's faces, rapt, enthralled, and suddenly, horribly, a pang of dread caught at Reverend Thomas's once cold heart, for it was the preacher, the strange young man, his gay hawk eyes bent upon his companion, his arm about her waist, and that companion, slim and young in pink-flowered gingham, swinging her rose-crowned hat by its dangling ribbons, Rosamond Perkins. Held by a spell he could not break, the wretched listener watched them approach, whispering, murmuring to each other, with little tender foolish sounds and laughter, and beneath him on a path, pause and turn, wrapped in each other's eyes. He saw, sharp in the moonlight that now strove valiantly against the fading gold, the face, upraised, ecstatic, of Rosamond Perkins, her red lips pouted, her blue eyes starry with love. He saw, bending to that kiss, the profile of the stranger, hooked nose meeting lean chin, those dancing light eyes, triumphant, beneath those horn-like tufts of curling hair, his arms, now no longer surpliced, lean and muscular in the tattered shirt of the afternoon, clasped about the slender body of the girl that the miserable Thomas Minchin now realized he loved with all the yearning passion of a man at last awake to love. How it happened exactly, the clergyman never knew. But at that moment, the spell seemed to snap, and he stumbled wildly forward, shrieking, desperate. For a moment, the entire universe seemed to swing around him in a whirling dance. Clouds and moon and sinking sun, crowding trees and reeling church towers, to the tune of a wild shouting and glorious laughter. And shaking, dazed, Mr. Minchin found himself standing on the path, a shaft of moonlight on his face, and Rosamond Perkins, quivering, smiling in his arms, her lips upturned to his. Dimly through a haze of rioting emotions, he heard her voice, loving, eager, human. Yes, yes, I love you. I've loved you all along. Darling, I felt you loved me, and after your sermon tonight I knew, I knew. My sermon? The reverend gentleman was still dazed, but she patted his cheek with her hand and laughed triumphantly. Your sermon, your wonderful sermon. If you could have heard yourself, the glorious theme, the fire and eloquence. If I had not loved you from the beginning, I should have loved you after tonight. You seemed all of a sudden to have dropped all your funny little stilted ways, your stiffness, the grim hardness and intolerance that, forgive me, seems to have so long enclosed your great and generous heart like the hard shell of a nut that is all sweet and wholesome and tender within. But tonight all this fell away, and you spoke like one who, long prisoned in a dark tower, looks out into the open and sees the wide and lovely sky. Still dazed, but with his hand fast locked in hers, Mr. Minchin turned towards the listening hills, the dark woods that seemed to watch him, the dusk-filled valley from which he still vaguely thought came an echo of joyous singing. They had gone again back to their secret places, those dear, strange people who had turned aside to teach him wisdom, and his heart swelled within him in love and sorrow that he could not thank them, bless them, tell them his humility, his deep-hearted gratitude. Mystified, the girl watched him as, moving away a step, on an irresistible impulse, he flung out both arms to the deep and smiling sky, and his voice, limpid, tremulous, drove to a joyous note that was almost a song. O great God Pan, I know thee, I thank thee, I bless thee, thee and all thy people great and small, for indeed, indeed beneath the mantle of the God whose name is love, is there not room in all his world to shelter? So Pan and his merry crew came to Little Ingleton, and so departed, 
and so the Reverend Thomas Minchin learnt humility. But deeply as he is now loved and revered by his flock, and indeed you would not know him for the same man, it is generally admitted that he has never again attained to quite the pitch of eloquence of that memorable midsummer day. Through cautious questioning of his betrothed, the young clergyman established, much to his own private relief, that not one of the congregation that night, not even Miss Perkins at the moment when Pan, playing his last elvish trick, literally thrust them into each other's arms, had the remotest idea that any but their own accustomed priest had led the service. The truth lay hid in Mr. Minchin's breast, and there it was buried, gratefully and thankfully. No one had dreamt of the things of so strange life and shape and form that had elbowed them during that amazing evensong. And in his undreamt of happiness with his pretty wife, the Reverend Thomas looks back upon that enchanted midsummer night with a deep and humble thankfulness. For since that marvelous hour of sight, when for a little while the veil before his eyes was torn away, and he saw a horned beast of the field, willful elf and goblin, fawn and nymph, mingling with village maid and man, jostle together singing prayer and praise in the church of Christ, he has walked humbly, trembling before men, and in his gentleness and understanding, his loving kindness and readiness to forgive sin, his old cruel bigotry is long forgotten. Only one day in the year does he mystify the village a little, and that is on Midsummer Day, now a great holiday in Little Ingleton, when parson and flock betake themselves to the fields and woods, dancing and singing and feasting, as in the old days, for joy of the dear green world, the warm sun and the merry pagan winds of heaven, and there is no stinting of the feast these days, good ale and foaming golden beer, shoulder prim lemonade and ginger pop, and there is no lack of junket and syllabub of Granny Calder's recipe to eat with the cakes and pies, the plum-starred buns, and the village foots it to the tune of Ragged Peter's fiddle and old dad Verity's drum till the moon rises glimmering over the treetops and busy little Mrs. Minchin begins to gather up the food for distribution on the morrow to her beloved poor. But then her husband comes, and despite her eager, puzzled questions, so frequent at first, though now she laughs and shrugs and lets it go, since he merely smiles and shakes his head, silently, reverently, the Reverend Jones chooses a portion of cake, of fruit and wine, best that remains, and disappears silently into the wood with his offering. There on a log or clear space of mossy turf, he lays his tribute, and after standing a moment with bowed head, goes softly away through the green shadows back to his flock, leaving behind him his yearly offering, libation to the old God who taught him wisdom, the God who was old when Christ was a stammering babe, the great God Pan, who, in a whimsy moment, came and played parson to save a parson's soul. The End